first tonight to two drug stories. In the first one, our business correspondent, Paul Salmon, looks at the illegal drug trade as a booming business. Like any other successful enterprise, it is attracting many of the country's best and brightest entrepreneurs, many of them very, very young. Queens, New York, gospel radio station WWRL, and morning show DJ, the Reverend Dell Shields. 9.40 a.m. on this beautiful Grace Tuesday, and I don't know if you've gotten out yet to get your daily newspaper, but uh, in both of the early morning papers, the headline from one says, the Kitty Core crack bust, and the second headline says, boy 10 busted for selling crack, pal 14 also seized. Dell Shields speaks to a greater New York community in which drugs, and especially crack, may now be the leading industry and the leading provider of high-paying jobs. Even for entry-level positions, such as lookouts at a crack house, starting pay is one to $200 a day. In this community, the drug trade touches everyone. We want to hear from you. Have you in any way been affected by this? When Reverend Shields opened the phone lines, all 10 light up. As gospel plays in the background, the first caller, a teenager, tells of his years in the drug trade. How old were you at the time? I started selling drugs when I was 10. You were, t oh my God, you were 10? Yes. So you, you can, can you relate to this kid who was busted today? Yes. Um, how much money did you make at 10, a week? A week, um, when I was younger on the average for like, when I first started selling about 500 a week. The drain come increase? Yes, it did. To what? like two, three thousand a week. Overall, this young man's income averaged $1,600 a week until he was arrested. He says a 10-month prison term has chastened him. You, you made $1,600, you don't have any money now, and you're not tempted to go back? I'm tempted, but um, it's like I don't want to go back to jail. The temptation, however, seems hard to resist. You could spend years in school and never come close to making this kind of money. I asked a different caller, also an ex-drug dealer, about the industry's upside. It pays well, there's a reasonable amount of security, you work with a number of different people. Is it a good job in that sense? Well, it's good if you figure, like, I remember one time I told my father when Al Capone first came on, I said, Dad, I said, why do you work hard and you don't have what this man has? You know what he did to me? He gave me the hit of my life. But I didn't see it until I got older what he meant. What his father meant by the spanking was that Al Capone and company were criminals. But back during Prohibition, they ran the violent drug trade of their era, the bootlegging of alcohol. The profits were huge, and for many at the economic bottom, bootlegging provided a ticket to the top. Today, of course, the media have been mapping the growth industry of this era, cocaine. To illustrate how the industries evolved, we're going to use the tools of the trade, a dollar bill and a mirror. This is one way of depicting the economies of the past, as a triangle, with most people in poverty near the bottom and fewer and fewer as you move toward prosperity and the top. Now, America introduced economic equality, a diamond-shaped economy, with most jobs in the broad working middle class and fewer above and below. But as we've lost good working class jobs in the middle, America has turned economic progress on its head and we're moving toward an hourglass economy. There are more good jobs above, more bad jobs below, and it's becoming an increasingly tight squeeze moving from the bottom to the top. In the past, manufacturing jobs used to fill out the economic middle, but they've been replaced by highly educated jobs above, dead-end jobs below, and those who make it have less and less in common with those who don't. Dr. King talked about that. He said that America is rapidly facing a situation of be the haves and the have-nots, and that's what we face with today. Um, the average black successful man or woman really does not relate to the kids behind. Economist Barry Bluestone is an expert on the polarization of the economy. There's more and more evidence that young people in America without a high school degree can't make it in America. The average high school dropout today makes 25% less than the average high school dropout 15 years ago. You simply can't make a decent living at Wendy's or McDonald's or Kmart, and that's why many kids are turning to the drug trade. Today, fewer and fewer kids see any future in starting at the bottom of the job ladder. 
Yes, it is true. I have a free training program. Can I tell you how many jobs I have and cannot fill? Because what? The young people say, oh, I don't want that particular job. The drug industry, of course, pays far better than being a janitor or a porter. We had many young people who told us they would not push a broom for $20,000. All right, for, for those, but those who are selling, yes. should they give up these, um, this rather lucrative position um, to, to take a job as a, as a porter? Uh, Reverend um, Shields, as I said to young men, if you have made $40,000 in a year, but you get busted and go to jail for five years, that amounts to less than a minimum wage. Not necessarily. That kid who called earlier said he was making $1,600 a week at age 15. That's tax-free, the taxable equivalent of more than $100,000 a year. It makes the wages of sin look pretty good, despite the plea with which Reverend Shields concludes his show. Actually, it's a composite story of a mother and the mother's agony with her son who is on drugs. Here she is, Dorothy Norwin. Leave it in the hands of the Lord. He's pawned all of my jewelry, my TV, and my stereo, too. Not far from WWRL's studios, the officially unemployed are in evidence. Lord, what in the world am I going to do? But many of them are very gainfully employed in the drug trade. Almost every block bears evidence of the industry. The police walk right past a typical hole through which crack is anonymously bought and sold. Job counselor Norman Damon has worked these Brooklyn streets for years. A Vietnam veteran, he's devoted his life to defeating the drug traders. So far, they've proved as intractable as the Viet Cong and equally dangerous as he witnessed recently. A young fellow uh, had an altercation with an older gentleman. And uh, the teenager's family were huddled around him trying to protect him and pleading with this fellow with a nine millimeter so please don't shoot my son. Please don't shoot my son. Mister, I'll get the money for you. Damon's story is shocking, but not unusual. This is coming to be a standard business transaction in the industry. As in Al Capone's day, a totally free market can quickly degenerate. And he came out and he had the gun out and he said, move, old man. I'm telling you to move, old man. And he shot the kid. And he told him, he said, you think it's a joke out here? It is not a joke out here. I'm not playing with you. It is not a joke. And he shot the kid. Killed him. The institutions of the ghetto offer little competition to the drug trade. Near a school, we interviewed a group of kids. How many of you go to school? I go to school. Oh, Pop, what's that? You go to school? Uh, yeah. The kid in the back goes to school, figuratively speaking. Or as his friends put it, he attends crack school, majoring in pipology and stealing cars. Where'd you say he went to school? <laughs> pipology, crack school. <laughs> <laughs> pipology. <laughs> 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 they want to the <laughs> no, and they go to school for ripping off cars. They're not a steal car. Um, stealing is an important part of the ghetto economy, since it provides the outside capital to support a major consumer industry like drugs. How good is the money dealing drugs? Well, uh, an individual can take $200, okay, and make $600 in a matter of four hours. Is it mostly the smarter kids who, who get involved in this? Yes, it is. Mostly the smarter kids. In other words, it's the most enterprising kids in the ghetto who stand to gain the most from the drug trade. As a result, both the ghetto and society are deprived of their talents. Society does, of course, provide institutions to discourage drug trafficking. Open one! We came to East Jersey State Prison, where a group of men serving life sentences has become famous for trying to convince kids in trouble that ultimately crime doesn't pay. So you don't be thinking about the consequences that you're going to suffer if you get caught. See, because you can't get away forever. For almost 15 years, Malik Wilkes has been telling the same story. We asked him to tell it to us. When they slam the door on you, when you're sitting in your cell lonely, when you can't call your mother, when you can't go outside and get in your car and go for a ride, you're going to realize everything that you was on the wrong route. It sounds pretty convincing, but the rhetoric may mask the reality of making a living in an hourglass economy. 
Harvey George, head of the Lifers Group, tells of a prostitute who disapproved of her son's job as a crack house lookout until she saw the money being made. She said she didn't see no reason to be begging and trying to ask a man to come in and spend the night with her so she could pay her rent when her son could stand out there in front of the building and watch for the crack dealer, watch for him, mind you, and bring two, three hundred dollars. She said she went out there and helped him. So you understand why they're doing it? Yeah, because she felt like, you know, she found a measure of self-respect. She didn't need a man to come lay there with her in front of her kids. So, but why couldn't she have gotten a job doing housework or something Not like that? Not making that kind of money. Raymond Hawkins is a man of numerous distinctions in prison. But back in the Brooklyn neighborhood we visited earlier, Hawkins was known as a drug dealer, beginning in eighth grade. Why did you think at 13 that you had to make a lot of money? If you look in America, you know, it's about designer this. It's about designer that. It's not about the, the station wagon anymore. It's about the Jaguar. It's about the BMW. The dreams of the economy's top half have become models for us all. And if we measure ourselves by such standards, no one ever has enough. That's the message of the Ivan Boskis and Mike Milkins atop the economy. It makes a mockery of incomes near the bottom. After working uh, 40 hours and looking at the paycheck after they take out the money in comparison to a guy that was on the corner, and he was saying, wow, you only got a hundred and some dollars and you've been working 40 hours. I've been out here for about 15, 20 minutes and I got that. And even money doesn't tell the whole story. You got to use your brain to, to, you know, be a drug dealer. You got to outfox this guy. You know, it's like a, it's the chaser and the chasee. How many times can I outfox this guy before he finally conquer me? So it's interesting. In a sense, yes, it is. Exciting. Definitely exciting. Yeah. Well paid. Without a doubt. We're back in Brooklyn. Tim and Andre are two of Norman Damon's success stories. They both hold jobs in a hospital. What percentage of the kids you used to know and go to school with are, are, are in the drug industry? A uh, majority of them. By 90 percent, uh, my, my peers is, is pushing drugs now. Right Tim and Andre now. are the hope for the future. But they work in the hospital boiler room and earn $24 a day, while peers make as much as 500 Has Have any of your friends ragged you about, um, you know, uh, uh, put yeah. you down? Mm -hmm. They did, yeah, said, well, you're working in the hospital, and I make this much a week, and you know you make that much. But hey, when they get in trouble and get locked up or whatever, I'll be still out here making what I got to do, making an okay living. I don't see how they survive if they're supporting themselves. Because of 24 hours a day, you could barely buy yourself something to eat during the course of a week, okay? Um, before I got arrested, I had a job making, I think, four seventy-five an hour, and I had my wife and two kids to take care of. By the time I came home and paid rent and bought food, I couldn't even buy me a pair of shoes. So I know they had to be going through hell making $24 a day. Everyone agrees the job opportunities exist, but the pay is modest, the initiative enormous. There's a lot of opportunities out here for a lot of, a lot of, of us young ones, but... You just got to put yourself to it. You got to be in it to win it. Because if, if you don't set your own goal, put yourself to it, then it's not going to come to you. You have to go to it. Minority kids represent the fastest growing segment of America's youth population. This is our future workforce. What are you going to do when you grow up, do you figure? What job? I'm going to be a carpenter. A carpenter? <laughs> a computer operator. A computer operator? Mm -hmm. A fireman. What do you want to do when you grow up? be a bus driver by my father. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? Man, football player, a boxer. Those are the things I wanted to be. A teacher. I think I wanted to be a lawyer, doctor. I always liked it to care for people. I'm a people person. It's actually touching. Yet these men wound up dealing drugs and death, literally. Several are in for murder. I saw somebody get shot right over there for drugs. Right there on the corner. The kids see the occupational risks in the drug trade, but in fact, for most people in the drug trade, the risks aren't that great. In an hourglass society like ours, with a great number of rich and a great number of poor, you see people getting away with murder at both ends. For individual kids, dealing may be a rational economic choice. 
For American society, however, it represents a devastating loss because all of us play on the same economic team. The drug profession penalizes the team in obvious ways. Stolen property, taxes for police and prisons. But worse, perhaps, and again, speaking strictly in economic terms, if American labor works the streets instead of the factories, unemployment may be lower than we think, but who is going to manufacture the future wealth of this society? How much will it cost you and me to carry the rest of the team? It's not just the personal tragedy of Raymond Hawkins or the fact that we pay $21,000 a year to keep him in prison. It's that, in or out, he doesn't contribute a thing to our imperiled prosperity.